Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this conference and, and moreover to be the first speaker and therefore get it out of the way so I can enjoy the rest of what I'm sure will be a fine week of talks. So this is going to be a, an experimental study, so there'll be lots of charts and graphs and so on. So I'm using a, a projector. Um, I do know that projector talks have certain problems that stuff tends to fly off the screen and you can't remember uh, what it is that was just there. So I have already posted the slides online on my website. Um, so you're welcome to download them now. Uh, this way has the advantage of having said that, now that if I look out in the audience and I see people fiddling with their phone, I think, ah, yes, they're just looking at what I said on slide seven. <laughs> All right, so let's get, uh, let's get started. So I want to talk about uh, conjecture, uh, somewhat implausible conjecture, that relates uh, three things. Floor homology, something coming out of gauge theory and symplectic geometry. Um, something more algebraic involving uh, orders on groups or maybe actions of groups on, on the line. Um, and then something which is, of course, a theme of this conference, namely taught foliations. So, so I guess I'm the first speaker I will need to define all, all my terms. Um, and the context then for today's talk is I'm going to be interested in uh, closed, oriented, irreducible, rational homology spheres. So rational homology is the same as, as that of the three sphere. Um, and the conjecture, of course I have to define my terms, I will in a minute. Uh, the conjecture I want to talk about is just that for an irreducible rational homology three sphere, the following three things are supposed to be equivalent. It has non-minimal Hagard floor homology. Uh, the fundamental group uh, is left orderable. And then finally, uh, the manifold has a co-orientable uh, top foliation. So is it written on the top line and that's the definition of minimal? Hmm? This here? So what's on top, you say? This? Yeah. That's rational homology three sphere. So since... Uh, QHS. Yeah, so this is what I'll mean by a, a rational homology three sphere. And I will typically forget to say irreducible, though I always mean it. Um, since this is what the talk resolves around, I have put it up there for you to remember, or not remember, since you can consult text. OK, so um, for today's talk, the Hagard floor homology, uh, introduced by Abdullah Fenzabo, um, will essentially be a black box. The only thing you really need to know about it for today's talk is that it's, um, this is the hat variant, the simplest variant. It's a vector space over the field with two elements. Um, and it has the property that uh, the dimension of this vector space is always at least the size of the first homology of my rational homology sphere Y. Right? So this is just some finite abelian group. Um, and uh, so you have this, this lower bound. Okay. Of course, I mean, this has many of you beautiful properties. It's been used to prove many uh, important uh, results. But for today, let's just kind of kind of take this as a, a definition. Well, not as a definition, but I'm just this is basically all you need to know. So since we have this inequality, there's going to be two kinds of manifolds. There's those for which this is an equality. Those will be called an L space. And there's those for which it's a strict inequality, and those will be called non-L spaces. Yes, that's right. So this notion of minimal is now going to be replaced by saying it's not an L space. Um, so examples of L spaces are any manifold with spherical geometry. For example, the lens space is LPQ. Uh, that's from whence uh, L spaces get their name. Um, some examples of non-L spaces would include this highly non-trivial fact that uh, if you do one on n Dane surgery on any non-trivial knot in S3, you get something which is not an L space. So maybe the overall theme of, of this conjecture is that these are, will all be kind of notions of, of large, I mean, it's sort of or complicated. Um, and so you know, L spaces are the things that are as uncomplicated as possible from the view of Hagard floor theory. But there are many manifolds which are quite complicated. Ah, yes, sorry. I should really say not the unknot or the trefoil. Or do I still want to say n bigger than two? <laughs> 
Let's say n bigger than 2. Good point. Good audience. OK. Isn't it 10 in the morning? Shouldn't everybody be asleep? All right, so that's the Hagard floor homology. As I said, it'll be just be a black box. Um, the second concept in this conjecture is uh, an order on a group. So if I have a group G, um, a left order is just a total order on the elements, which is invariant uh, under left multiplication. So if you have uh, elements G less than H, and you take another element of your group F, then F times G has to be less than F times H. Um, for a countable group, uh, this is equivalent to saying that the group embeds in the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the line. I mean, in fact, if you're seeing this definition for the first time, I would actually take this as a definition. Right? It's saying that a, a group is left orderable if it acts on the line uh, faithfully by homeomorphisms. So, I mean, the simplest example of an orderable group is just the real numbers under addition with the usual um, order we put on the real numbers. Or, I mean, orderability passes to subgroups, so the integers, a countable group, which is left orderable. Um, three groups turn out to be orderable. Uh, what are some examples of non orderable groups? Well, it's not so hard to see that if your group is finite, or more generally, if it has torsion, um, then it can't be orderable. Because you know, take an element, maybe it's bigger than 1, let's say. Well, then multiplying that equation by g, then you see g squared is bigger than 1, and then g cubed is bigger than 1. And that will prevent uh, any power of g from being the identity. So um, there are some orderable groups. There are some non-orderable groups. And then just for conciseness of notation, I'm going to say that a three manifold itself is orderable if its fundamental group is left orderable. Right. And then the third of our cast of characters is the one most closely connected to this workshop, uh, namely a taut foliation. So, um, so a foliation is, in my talks, is always going to have two dimensional leaves. So it's just some partition of my three manifold into subsets looking locally like this picture. Um, and in terms of the smoothness of this foliation, I'm only going to require that uh, there's a well-defined tangent plane at every point, um, and that that tangent plane varies continuously as you move along a leaf. We'll hear more um, on Friday from Rachel Roberts about uh, the importance of, of smoothness um, or the subtleties that arise when you consider things that are this rough, but fortunately, I don't have to deal with that. Uh, also, I'm going to assume that uh, taut foliations are co-orientable. So some nice co-orientation of the leaves, or since my manifold's orientable, uh, equivalently an orientation of the leaves themselves. This isn't a standard assumption. It just it saves me words later on. Um, so this, so far, with just these first two conditions, um, this is a very floppy kind of object. Every three manifold. Um, has a uh, foliation satisfying those two conditions. Um, but if you add this additional condition that there's some loop in your three manifold, which is transverse to the foliation uh, and meets every leaf, then it turns out that, although that seems like not much of an additional assumption perhaps, uh, that turns out to say that the sort of transverse dynamics to this um, foliation end up being highly interesting. And it turns out that that then tells you this actually gives a, a big restriction on the topology of the manifold. So for example, if your manifold has a taut foliation, then its universal cover is the three is R3. Um, and so in particular, the fundamental group is not finite. All right, so uh, again, having a taut foliation is a kind of uh, a large thing. So uh, maybe now that I've actually defined my terms, I should go back to what I wrote here in the language that I'll say these things from now on. So the following are supposed to be equivalent, uh, that y is not an L space. 
y is orderable. And I said I wasn't going to say co-orientable anymore. OK, so why? I mean, these things at first glance seem to have little or nothing to do with each other. Um, so let me try to outline um, some of the connections that are known between these, these objects. Um, and then I'll tell you something about the results that some of the results that have been proved in support of this conjecture. And then I'll finally I'll come back and, and for the last half talk about the um, experimental results that I've been doing um, with hyperbolic manifolds. In particular, I'll tell you about a new technique for building top foliations. OK, so what does this diagram say? So uh, here's one of our conditions. Uh, y has a top foliation. So the only implication amongst those three allegedly equivalent things that is known is that if you have a top foliation, then um, your manifold is not an L space. Um, so this goes to work, I guess, originally in a slightly different floor homology by Kronheimer, Rothka, Osbath, and Zabo, where you use this top foliation to build a pair of, of contact structures by the work of Ellie Ashberg and Thurston, or in this degree of, of undegree of smoothness, Kazez, Roberts, and uh, Bowden, um, to build some nice contact structures. And you use that to engage with the uh, um, gauge theory or symplectic geometry of, of Hegel floor homology. Anyway, so if you have a top foliation, you are not an L space. Um, so that's the one arrow that you have amongst those three things. And then it was conjectured by uh, Boyer, Gordon, and Watson, based on some of the evidence I'll talk about, um, that uh, non-L space should be equivalent to being orderable. Uh, and then, well, if you add in this additional arrow, I'm not sure if this is attributed to anyone. Anybody willing to want the name on this arrow? Going, going. <laughs> All right. So Sarah Dean Rasmussen's conjectures um, that you have this arrow here. So OK, this doesn't look so far. I mean, maybe I should have hid this initially, but it's not my style. So we have one arrow amongst these things. Um, but there actually are some arrows which don't quite go as far as you want, but go, go close. So if you have a top foliation, right, orderability, I said, if you hadn't seen it before, the definition of orderability you should take is it acts on the line. So it turns out that if you have a top foliation, you actually get two actions on spaces which are, well, closely related to the line. Um, one of these is Thurston's universal circle. Um, so this is some way of gluing together. You go to the universal cover. You get a foliation of R3 by planes. You kind of glue together the circles at infinity of these things in some consistent way. Uh, Danny and I wrote down a proof, somewhat different proof, of the existence of this universal circle. But in any event, if you have one of these top foliations, you get an action um, of your group on the circle. Well, that's not an action on a line, but if you do have an action on a line, that does also give you an action on the circle. You just think of an action on the circle where you fix some particular point, and you view the complement of that point as R. Um, the other one-dimensional action you get from a top foliation is when you go to this universal cover, R3 foliated by planes, you can collapse each plane to a point. Uh, you'll get something which is locally one-dimensional. Um, of course, your group, fundamental group, acts on its universal cover. It acts on this leaf space. and so. The top foliation gives you an action on a, well, it turns out it's not necessarily Hausdorff, but if you put that aside, you get an action on a one-dimensional manifold. Um, so in particular, again, if you're orderable, you have an example. Simply connected, yes. Thank you, Danny. I should have said it's not just any one manifold. It's a simply connected, possibly non-Hausdorff. So from this diagram, the justification I could give for this conjecture or this conjecture. Uh, well, this conjecture is just, well, this arrow goes here. Why not? Um, the motivation for this conjecture is if enough of these arrows here are invertible a lot of the time for whatever reason, well, then you could start to run around the diagram and uh, show something about the blue thing at 
Are there questions so far? All right, so that's the uh, conjecture. Here are some of the implications between these pieces. Um, so in terms of theorems, what do we know? So there's a very nice recent result of Hanselman, Rasmussen, Rasmussen, and Watson when combined with also recent result of uh, Boyer and Clay, which we will hear about, I believe, on, on Thursday, um, is that the conjecture is actually true for all graph manifolds. Graph manifold is just one that's built from cipher fiber spaces by uh, gluing them together along tori. So that's a large class of, of manifolds for which this is true. Um, another example result um, is if you combine work of Lee and Roberts with a recent theorem of Mark Kohler and myself, you can prove the following um, statement. So if you take a knot in the three sphere, and let's assume it's Alexander polynomial has a simple root on the unit circle, turns out to be quite a common thing. Um, then it turns out that any Dane surgery on this knot, which is sufficiently close to the longitude, um, satisfies, satisfies this conjecture. Um, in particular, it has both a top foliation, that's the result of, of Lee and Roberts, and it's uh, ordable by the result of Mark and myself. In addition, there's been lots of other work, um, especially on branch covers, uh, work of Cameron and Ty we'll hear about on, I believe, Wednesday. What I want to talk about today is um, examples in a different direction. Instead of focusing on um, things like graph manifolds or things that are in some sense, these are things which are kind of close to being uh, sort of close to the longitude. Um, I decided I would look at uh, a few rational homology spheres they had on offer at the local Wawa. So um, I looked at roughly 265,000 hyperbolic rational homology spheres. So this is basically everything. So the way I got these is I took uh, links in the three sphere with less than 15 crossings. And I threw out the alternating ones because that's a case where the conjecture is known. Um, at least part of the conjecture is known. And so um, then I I took those links, uh, there's like 600,000 of them or something, and I took their two full branch covers and I threw out the ones that are not hyperbolic because, um, well, I'm sort of from the hyperbolic geometry background and so I'm a prejudiced person, I threw the others out. And so I had these nice um, rational homology spheres and so what I'm going to tell you about is um, my attempts to well, it's really my attempt to disprove this conjecture. I don't believe it for whatever reason, um, but uh, it's really therefore a story of failure because I'm going to show you a bunch of data and then every last bit will be consistent with this, with this conjecture. Um, so what did I want to say about these um, homology spheres for those of you who are interested in hyperbolic geometry? Uh, well, so this is a little histogram of the volumes of these guys. So known that the smallest volume hyperbolic manifold is the Weeks manifold, volume about around one. Um, so these guys, here's just a histogram of the volume. So the volume, the average of the volume is uh, about seven and a half. The variance is two. Um, you can also plot the injectivity radius. So that's the uh, length of the shortest closed geodesic in your manifold. Um, here's a histogram of that. In this case, the average length of that curve is 0.3, and um, the variance is 0.2. So you might be familiar, if you've worked with hyperbolic manifolds, there's something called the Hodgson weak census of closed hyperbolic three manifolds. What is? Oh, I'm um, sorry. This is the injectivity radius, which is one half of the length of the shortest closed geodesic. Thank you, Peter. Um, so there's this thing called the Hodgson weak census, uh, which an enumeration of various low complexity hyperbolic manifolds, almost all of those are rational homology spheres. In particular, about 11,000 of them are. Um, if you're familiar with that sample, the difference here is these volumes are quite a bit bigger. Um, and also the injectivity radius is sometimes quite a bit smaller. So to make this census, they imposed an arbitrary lower bound on the injectivity radius, which is actually about 0.3. So it's 
So you might have heard me give this talk before. I, before I was focused on the, these Hodgson Weeks manifolds, and I, I have the same story there, but uh, I decided that wasn't enough, so decided to uh, look at more manifolds. All right, so what are my um, results so far? Um, so the first is that, okay, of these manifolds, it turns out that 73% of them are L spaces and 27% of them are not. Uh, so to do this, I used a program of Bohajan, uh, which implements the bordered floor homology um, theory of, Lis of Lipschitz, Oswald, and Thurston. Uh, and this is actually why the examples I looked at were double branch covers of knots in the, the three sphere. That's the one case of the bordered floor machine that you can just uh, pull off the shelf. Um, okay, so 73% of them are L spaces, at, and 27% uh, of them are not L spaces. Uh, and for the other properties, the orderability and the top foliations, I don't have complete information. Um, I mean, in the case of top foliations, I guess I think it is known to be decidable, algorithmic, that you determine whether you have one, but it's certainly not uh, practical to do. I'm going to tell you uh, about a heuristic approach, which works very well in practice. Um, and then the business of deciding whether something's orderable or not, um, that's not even known to be decidable for three manifold groups. So there's no, there's no algorithm. But despite that, never let that kind of thing stop you in practice. Um, turns out I can show at least 44% of these manifolds are non-orderable, and all of those ended up in the L space box, much to my unhappiness. So this is something like 60% of the L spaces, they're known to be non-orderable. Um, there's 3% uh, of them, I was able to show they are orderable. All of those are in um, this box here, the non-L space box, as the conjecture says they should. Uh, now in addition, I was able to show that 24% of these manifolds have top foliation. Of course, that's the one theorem we have in this picture. All of those guys do have to live in the non-L space box. In fact, um, it's about 90% of the non-L spaces. Uh, for these guys, I can find um, these top foliations. And for a few of them, um, they turn out to be have orderable, orderable fundamental groups. Other questions so far? Danny. Uh, so, so Danny asks, what's the average average ranker size? Size of H1, it's about 400. No, it tends to, the, the, the rank of the groups is small, typically. Is there, is there another question over here? That's right, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, I, these, it's not, you know, the tolerance is probably only about a, you know, half a percent or something. But I mean, these are these are all to scale, and the intersections that are shown are the correct ones. Oh, God. No, no, all of these are being done. So, the, but this, the um, approach I took for this, the the one thing that's sort of being coming from known work is the L space versus non L space. Uh, everything else is, is being done just brute force in ways that I'll describe. So. Okay, so for this conference, I wanted to focus on um, the taut foliation part of the computational story. Um, so, I twenty something like uh, twenty four percent of the manifolds have taut foliations. And so um, that boils down at least 24%, of course, maybe more. That means I had to exhibit almost 64,000 taut foliations on these, on these various manifolds. Um, and the technique I used is the following uh, structure. So the, it starts with I, I have a one vertex triangulation of um, the three manifolds. And 
um, I'm going to find this concept called a laminar orientation of the triangulation. And the property that will be useful is if you have a triangulation with a laminar orientation, then it implies the existence of a top foliation. So let me uh, explain what the uh, conditions are. So the first thing a laminar orientation is, is just an orientation of the edges of the triangulation. Uh, and I want it to be acyclic. So for every face, every triangle, you're not allowed to have the three edges oriented in a consistent manner. So that means, in other words, that up to isomorphism, every face is going to look exactly like um, this picture. And uh, just for notation, I'm going to call this edge, which is kind of special. It goes from the source to the sink. I'm going to call that the long edge of the triangle. So if you read uh, Hatcher's algebraic topology more carefully than I do, you'll realize that this condition here is exactly the same as saying that this is a delta complex. Um, the second condition is if you have your um, faces all look like this, then you can see that up to isomorphism, each tetrahedra looks like this picture here. So there's some, the edges, there's kind of a, a unique vertex, which is a source, a unique vertex, which is a sink, and everything else just kind of flows up to that. Uh, and so you have this picture, and um, there's one edge, which in my picture here is the back edge. Uh, there's one edge which is long in both of the adjacent faces, right? So this back edge is long in this face, and it's also long in this face. Uh, and I'm going to call that very creatively, I'm going to call that the very long edge. So the second condition uh, is that every edge in my triangulation is adjacent to some tetrahedra where it is not very long. So you're not allowed to have a situation where rotating around this edge, you just would always see the same picture. Um, and then finally, uh, the third condition is this orientation introduces an equivalence relation on the faces of the triangulation by the following rule. I mean, none of this should make any particular sense so far. This is just a, a giving you a condition which I think the thing that will be clear is it's easy enough to check um, computationally, but then I'll have to, of course, explain why this has anything to do with top foliations. Um, so the equivalence relation on faces that I want to use, it just says um, in my standard picture of the tetrahedra, I'm going to say that these two faces are equivalent. Um, these are two faces. This edge is long in one of the faces and not the other. Uh, and then there's one other situation that's kind of the same, which is that the other two faces, and I want to declare them equivalent. And the third condition is that the relation on faces generated by that rule has to have exactly one equivalence class. Um, and my theorem is that if you have something satisfying all these conditions, then in fact it has uh, a taut foliation. Are the questions just on the statement? No, no. So that's not. It's not the ones that are adjacent to the very long face. It's. Um, let's see. So it's. If you look in this thing, there's four faces. So there's four long edges. Uh, two of them are actually the same. They're the very long edge. But then there's two other edges which are long in one of the faces, and I declare that the two faces adjacent to this edge are equivalent, and then the two faces adjacent to this edge. Are equivalent. Right, these are the kind of like sort of long edges. No, no, it does not. That's right. That's right. So this gener uh, so this I'm just saying, look at the equivalence relation generated by saying these guys are equivalent. That gives you some number of equivalence classes. And the condition is there's only one. No, no, these are all copies of this picture. Can you distinguish between the common edge in one case and the other? Um, yes, because in this case, the common edge starts at the source. And in this case, it ends at the sink. But I don't distinguish that from the point of view of the equivalence relation. I say they're both, they're both equivalent. 
Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> the equivalence relation is generated by the rule that if you look at the very short edges <laughs> in your tetrahedron and declare the adjacent faces to be equivalent, you get this nice creature. <laughs> it's the picture. Yeah, no, the, look, this is me. It's always the picture, not the word. OK, um, so now why, why does this have anything to do with topoations? This is the proof in a single picture. <laughs> That's right. So, so this is really, I mean, it's not a simplicial complex that you took a bunch of, of cells, tetrahedra, and you glued their faces by affine maps, and in the result, there's only one vertex. You can modify this c condition to allow more vertices, but it's slightly more complicated. And I, in practice, one vertex triangulations are what you get because they're the ones that minimize the number of tetrahedra. Um, so the proof is you take your standard tetrahedra like this with its edges oriented and you stick inside this branch surface. So the branch surface basically consists of a quadrilateral uh, cutting across and then two triangles which are sort of bent onto the um, uh, quadrilateral like so. It doesn't look particularly symmetric, maybe, in terms of this has to, of course, match up with the other tetrahedra glued to these faces. It doesn't maybe look particularly symmetric, but in fact, if you look at each of the triangles on the boundary of this tetrahedra, you always see this picture where you have the long edge and then something comes out and then it splits in two going to the two short edges. So this thing um, makes sense in the sense it gives you a nice branch surface glued up throughout this uh, manifold, and then um, what you want to show is that this branch surface carries uh, a taut foliation. I want to apply uh, Tau Li's condition on laminar branch surfaces, uh, which is that they, uh, if you have a, a surface basically with no sync disks, then you're entitled to um, say that. There's some other conditions. But the main condition is if you have no sync disks, then you're entitled to uh, a taut, or a, in this case, sorry, an essential lamination. So the point is if you have your branch surface picture, well, let's see, maybe I'll go. Well, if you have your your branch surface, um, you have the branches, that's the complements of the singular stuff. Um, in my example here, actually, the branches correspond to the edges. Right, so if you cut along the singular locus, you get um, a bunch of squares and then also um, some triangles here that are associated. Each meets um, one of the edges in a single point. So it's kind of a dual to the, the edges. And I mean, I should have said this. Branch surface, it gets a co-orientation, consistent co-orientation from the orientations of, of the edges. Um, and along, if you look at uh, one of these singular bits where it comes together, um, the thing that you, you want to avoid, it turns out, well, not avoid, but you want to put along these singular things little arrows, which point sort of in away from the um, sort of into the cusp. And then the thing that Tao Li tells you you want to avoid, uh, you want to avoid a disk somewhere, um, well, one of these branches, where all the arrows around this disk point inward. And in my picture, there's only one place that kind of thing can happen. It's in this back, this back square, right? Because there's something pointing in this way, and there's something pointing in this way. Um, and this condition here is exactly saying that as you go around the edge, you're not always seeing pieces like this. So eventually, you see one of these other pieces, and so it's not a sync disk. So this, this condition really could be rewritten as the associated branch surface does not contain a sync disk. <laughs>
Um, and then uh, what is the second condition saying? Um, see, there's only one vertex in my triangulation. So if I take that vertex and I start blowing up a ball, it'll come out and I'll start filling this thing up from um, the three sides. And so you'll get, well, you'll get a ball and it'll have these kind of sutures on it corresponding to, um, well, if I thicken this up, corresponding to the vertical boundary of a neighborhood of this branch surface. Uh, and what I want is when I look at that ball, I want it to just be, well, it's a ball, but I want it to just have a single suture. So the complement is a product, this disk cross I. Um, and the equivalence relation that I put on earlier is actually just counting the number of uh, sutures. It, as you, you have this little sort of vertical and, well, vertical uh, boundary here, which corresponds to this face being glued, I mean, sorry, that runs from this face to this face. And then you have the other vertical boundary of the neighborhood of this branch surface, which goes from this face to that face. That's exactly the equivalence relation I had earlier. Um, so to say that the uh, equivalence relation has a single equivalence class is the same as saying that you get a ball with a single suture. So this, is, so this says it satisfies Tau's condition that there are no sync disks. And this is saying that the complement to this branch surface is just disk cross i. So then I can use Tau Lee's result to, to put a lamination um, in this branch surface. And then you just fill it in across this little product disk. And that gives you uh, a foliation, which is clearly taught because, in fact, remember, there's only one vertex. Every edge of this triangulation is, in fact, a loop, which is transverse to the foliation. Um, and so then my method for finding these uh, 64,000 top foliations was just to generate many one vertex triangulations of these manifolds. Uh, these triangulations typically had 20 uh, tetrahedra, sometimes as many as 30. Um, and then for each one, you just search for uh, orientations of the edges, which are acyclic and which satisfy these, these conditions. Now, there's a lot of such orientations, well, at least a modest number. I mean, if you have 20 tetrahedra, you have basically 20 edges. Two to the 20 is about a million. A million is not a big number from the point of view of a computer. Uh, and in any event, you can kind of... Uh, you, know, you can do more intelligent search than enumerate them all. Uh, in fact, the way I do part A is I just turn it into a SAT problem. So solving some uh, system of equations and Boolean variables. And I just dump it into a generic SAT solver. Uh, oh, it just, um, so, so it looks like, yes, good question. Um, let me draw a picture. So in the neighborhood of the one vertex, what you see uh, looks like this. With the foliation looking like planes. Just coming through like that. Um, so I should say that this criterion is uh, very much inspired by a old paper of Danny's uh, where he was looking at constructing um, foliations or vibrations on, on manifolds. And so this, this, another way you can interpret this uh, is something about you're, really, you're looking at neighborhood of the vertex and you really want it to look like this picture. Um, if there had been other, you know, if there were some arrows going down in here, then you wouldn't have a nice, a nice thing. Are there other questions? Yes, um, Katie. Why are we trying to do pair cross lamination when we do scale? Um, so I think, as written, probably not, uh, because I'm insisting on uh, the triangulation having one vertex. If I re re relax that, then I think probably I have not thought it through, but I think the answer is probably yes. Um, that there would be, given a top foliation, there would be some triangulation. You know, you make it really fine, and it should satisfy that. That's certainly what happens in the case of vibration. Are there other questions? Yes, exactly. 
Yes, that's right. So yeah, you, you know that you have a top foliation. If you blow some air into it, you can make it carried by one of these branch surfaces without sink discs. And then sort of in each complementary region, you put some vertices and maybe you have to squash things a little together because you want um, the product regions to all be discs and not higher things. But yeah, I think you could. That's right. No, no, actually this, I should say this is very, um, this, this is a very new thing that I've been trying. Um, and uh, the sticking point now is actually just uh, generating enough interesting triangulations of these manifolds. Uh, so I mean, I, for a while I had the computers back in Illinois running and you know, every day they come back with a hundred more that they've found. But I think it's actually the, there's some, some issues with the way the triangulations are being generated. They're being generated by a program called SnapP, which really likes hyperbolic geometry. And so if it ever finds a triangulation which doesn't look very hyperbolic, it throws up its hands and crashes. Uh, what well doesn't crash, it's a polite message. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I, I need to fix these sort of things. But I, I, I'm only just getting started. I'm sure it will not get all of them. Um, and who knows, maybe it will get us a counterexample. But um, yeah, this is, this is, what does the Amos always say? A preliminary report? Are, are there other questions? All right, so um, the thing I want to talk about uh, briefly was um, something more related to the floor homology side of, of the story. Uh, and that is, in this data, there's a, a pattern. I mean, so, okay, so, you know, we have this, this all the data I have is, is consistent with the conjecture, despite my, my best efforts to the contrary. And it's clear that if you want to find a counterexample of this conjecture, you really need to find sort of the interface between the L spaces and non-L spaces. Or you can't just, j just going to the store and, and taking the first quarter million manifolds that are on the shelf, it's not going to cut it. So I took the data I had um, and tried to be able to predict uh, whether or not a manifold in my sample was an L space by looking at other um, information, like its volume or its injectivity radius or the size of its homology or um, what else did I look at? Oh, various measures of the size of the fundamental group in terms of a presentation and anything I could think of. I, I don't know, there were like 30 variables or something. And in the end, only one of them had any predictive power for uh, whether or not something was an L space. And that was just the size of the first homology. Uh, so the bigger the size of the first homology is, it turns out that in this sample, it increases the probability that it is uh, an L space. So uh, from one perspective, this is counterintuitive, um, namely that, I mean, the reason that HF hat has dimension at least the size of this is because really it decomposes the sum over the spin C structures corresponding to the elements of this. So you might think, well, if this is really big, there's actually a whole bunch of different, in some sense, independent homology groups. And if you thought, well, each one has some tiny probability of being positive, the more first homology groups you have, the more likely it is that one of them is non-trivial. So the more likely it's not an L space. But this is completely counter to the data I have. Um, and actually, it turns out that you get a slightly better prediction if you normalize things by uh, taking the first homology and dividing by the hyperbolic volume. Um, so this is the distribution of, of that. This is a histogram. So on average, this quantity is about 33, um, which corresponds to this thing itself being about 400, as I was saying in response to Danny's question. Um, and so then you can plot, OK, so this is uh, this ratio basically just the amount of first homology normalized. And you can look at all manifolds whose um, ratio is basically 20. And you can ask what portion of them in this sample are um, L spaces. And so the answer is uh, about 70%. Um, and once you get above 30, well, maybe 35, they're all L spaces. Of course, there's lots of these manifolds for which that ratio is more than 35. That's all of these guys. Um, all of these guys are have that ratio. And all of these, every single one of these guys is an L space. 
That's right. Um, so I've also reproduced this for, uh, in fact, first notice this in the hydrogen weak census. Um, and I also tried various things to sort of slice the data finer, um, like take knots that had, that were sort of far from being alternating, um, or take ones whose volume was restricted or injectivity rate is restricted, and you get, you get exactly the same pattern. This seems pretty robust. Um, just because there's so many of them. Yeah, it's just a portion of them that uh, is an L space. Um, so anyway, this is a, a strange thing to me. Um, and I guess here's one uh, other way of, of interpreting this. Um, so this is a plot where on this axis I have just the size of the first homology. Uh, and then this axis I have the dimension of HF hat. Uh, and so the theorem that I mentioned at the beginning says that um, if I took one of my manifolds and plotted it, plotted its ratio, it has to lie above the line uh, y equals x, above the line of slope 1, right? Because the HF hat is bigger than uh, h1 of y. Um, and um, so anyway, I didn't want to draw a quarter million points because you wouldn't be able to see them. So what this is is a density plot of those quarter million points. Um, and you can see that if your homology is small, uh, the, you know, if it's close to zero, then HF hat typical rank might be about 25 or something like that, in particular 25 more than the minimum. But then as you start ratcheting up the homology, um, the, uh, you tend to be much less, oh sorry, should, I should have said, I took out the L spaces in this picture. The L spaces would be all along this line, and they would be incredible, I mean, just all you'd see was them. So I, I stripped them out. These are the non-L spaces. Um, and so for non-L spaces, you could look at the gap between the size of H1, um, or, or rather the gap between the size of HF hat and the size of H1. And that's what's being visualized here. So as you increase the size of H1, this gap tends to narrow until past some point uh, there are no non-L spaces left. Other questions on this? Oh, and then um, just a, a, so I have a couple minutes left just to say a little bit more about the computations of the other parts of this. Um, as I said, for finding HF hat, I use this program of Jean, um, which uh, implements the bordered Hagard floor homology. I have um, 300,000 more manifolds in the computer cooker right now that are not two-fold branch covers. They're obtained by uh, Dane filling um, some other manifolds. And there, it's going to have to, I'm going to need some new technique to compute the Hagard flow homology. I want to use the recent results of Rasmussen and Rasmussen clar classifying kind of the L space surgery slopes. I think that should be sufficient to, to handle these. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if some of these patterns persist. Uh, in terms of showing something, the orderability uh, is in some sense the most, um, well, in practice I don't know if it makes any difference, but there's no known algorithm for deciding if a three-manifold group is orderable. I mean, there's certainly no algorithm for deciding if a given finitely presented group is orderable. And almost no question about finitely presented groups is decidable. Um, so that the heuristics that I used for trying to determine the orderability. Uh, so one side is you try to determine, you try to show it's non-orderable. So what you do is you start with some presentation for the fundamental group. It turns out for reasons I don't understand, you pick one with lots of generators. Something pretty much like a, the presentation that comes from a one vertex triangulation. And then you look at the Cayley graph of some modest radius, three or five or four or whatever, um, in that generating set. So some part of your group. And you just try to order all the elements in that ball. Right, so you, you want to partition them up um, in such a way that that rule that I had is satisfied. Of course, many times you take two elements in this ball and multiply them together, you leave the ball. And those guys you just ignore. But you do want this condition 
of the order respect multiplication for stuff that lives inside this. And of course, if you find on, in this ball that there is no such order, the whole group can't be ordered. You can't even order this piece of it. Okay. And so that, uh, if you want to do things like this, you really have to solve the word problem in your group. You've got to be multiplying elements. And it turns out the right way to do that uh, is to use matrix, just multiply matrices. These are hyperbolic manifolds. They're just nice polynomial representations. If you use that, uh, you can do this reasonably efficiently. The thing that, the other thing, so that's sort of non-ordered. Uh, if you want to show a group is orderable, computationally, I really know of, of I've only ever implemented this one thing. Uh, something's also been used very extensively in some of the theoretical results about branch, uh, branch uh, covers of knots in S3. Um, and that is to find representations to the Lie group PSL2R tilde. Right, so this is just a universal covering Lie group of PSL2R. Um, and just as PSL2R acts on the circle, PSL2R tilde acts on the line. Uh, so if you can find a homomorphism to this thing, you can uh, that will uh, turn out to imply that your group is orderable. So to do that, I first I went and I found as many PSL2R representations as I could. Uh, these turns out to be plentiful. Uh, there's roughly eight of them per manifold. Right? The, you should expect there to be lots of these because I mean, the whole anomy representation of the hyperbolic structure, by local rigidity, it basically, you can think of it, it does, it lands in like PSL2 R, PSL2 of some number field. And then if that number field has a real embedding, which typically they do, um, you're going to get a whole bunch of representations into SL2R. Yes? Yes, so that's another thing is you could also look at the Euler class associated with these top foliations. I have not yet done this, but that is definitely something I need to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so one, one source of, of orderings in some cases is if you have a top foliation that has this action on the universal circle, if the Euler class for that vanishes, then you get to lift that to an action on R. Um, and so that's definitely something that I shall look for, um, hopefully in the near future. But so with these guys, it turns out there's lots of these representations, roughly eight per manifold. But on the other hand, the second cohomology of groups of these things, which are the same as their first homology, um, they're pretty big. They're like average size, something like 400. So you have this Euler class, which lives in H upper two. You might think you have roughly a one in 400 chance that it will be zero. Um, and so consequently, that, that turns out to be roughly right. Um, consequently, although there were 2.13 million PSL2R representations, I only extracted from this um, a little over 7,000 uh, actual orders on three manifold groups. No, no, this is by computing the Euler class. If you insisted that H upper 2 is 0, that's like yeah, some, I don't know, 500 manifolds. I mean, it's not, yeah. Yeah, no, no. You have to, you have to take the, the representation and you have to compute the Euler class. Okay. And so it's, it's interesting. One, one, one weird thing is that, so this portion is roughly right. If you, if you take the size of H2 of these manifolds on average, or, or you could do, be more refined than that, but let's just do that. And you take the size of this, and you could ask how many of these should lift and how many manifolds you get. You do get roughly this number. But it's very far from random um, in the sense that if that was what was going on, I would have found tens of thousands of counterexamples to the conjecture. So on average, it is true the odds of one of these lifting is about the size of, the fir of, of H upper 2. But in any given instance, it's either 0 if it's an L space, or it's something like four times that if it's not an L space. I understand from, from the popular press that p-values are, are losing favor in the sciences, which disappoints me because you can ask sort of to what extent this data can allow you to reject the null hypothesis if the conjecture is false. Um, and the answer is, well, I used to have data which made it be like the p-value was 10 to the minus 1,000. And with this, I didn't even calculate it because it's so small. You know, no one 
You can't tell the difference. All right, well, that's, um, that's all I, I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for your attention.